Remember a long time ago before we went away, we were going through the minor prophets of the Old Testament. And Zechariah, he's called a minor prophet, but he's a powerful, he has a powerful message. And I was thinking about those of you that heard uh, Pastor John Pesarek Sunday evening. Uh, our brother John was here, and he shared about how he felt the way things in the world were going, that in three or four months, and he wasn't, he wasn't making a prediction or anything, but he said in, you know, before, like before the end of this year, things are going to really start heating up in the world. Now, we know you can say they're heating up now when you hear the news and hear what's going on with uh, Russia and Iran and Israel and the, and the Mideast. And so much that's happening is lining up to fulfill Bible prophecy. Uh, we don't know when the rapture is going to happen. It could be soon. It might not be soon. We don't know. We know there are some things, and I agree with our brother John. He said that there are some things that can happen before the rapture. There's a Psalm 83 war. There's a Gog and Magog war. Things that can happen. And uh, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But we do know this. Jesus said, when, these, when you see these things, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. So when we see these things happening in the world, it's not supposed to cause us concern. It's supposed to give us an excitement. It's supposed to give us hope that the things that God said are going to happen are indeed happening. And Zechariah, as an Old Testament prophet, really looks forward to the things that are yet to come. And he was, again, one of those prophets, and I've said this before, when you read the Old Testament prophets, when, they, when, they, when God gave them a vision, it very oftentimes he did not give them what we call the church age. They saw things happening as like one event. The first and second advent of Christ, they saw that as, as one thing. Uh, he did not allow them to see the mystery, what Paul called the mystery uh, of the church which was a mystery in the, in the New Testament is something that was hidden and is now revealed. So they didn't see all that. So Zechariah was seeing things happening, and, and the visions that he was given were visions that he just took to be an event or a series of events. But we know that we can, we can separate them between Old Testament and New Testament times, and they're still all fulfillment. Now, uh, there are things that are yet to be fulfilled, and Zechariah talks about these things, and his prophecies deal specifically with the nation of Israel. They don't deal with the church because he didn't understand about the ecclesia, the body of Christ that we talked about uh, Sunday morning. They deal with the nation of Israel and how the world powers deal and have dealt with the nation of Israel. Remember when we read through the prophet Daniel, we were talking about how Daniel had the vision of the four great empires, the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire. Now, there were other empires in the world, but he was dealing specifically with the world powers or the world orders that had something to do with the nation of Israel. And that's pretty much what Zechariah deals with in his prophecy. His name means one whom the Lord remembers. Uh, he was in the priestly line, and he prophesied about the same time as the prophet Haggai. You remember we uh, read through the prophet Haggai, and he admonished the people. They started building the temple, but they didn't finish. And he said, when are you going to finish what you started? And, uh, of course, they did. Uh, it deals with the mind of God concerning the restored remnant. And there are four sections in, in Zechariah. We're going to probably be here about two or three weeks reading through this prophecy because there's a lot here. The four sections, there's an introduction, which is just the first six verses. Then Zechariah was given eight visions, and we're going to talk about some of them tonight and some of them next week. Then there is a doctrinal, uh, doctrinal uh, passage where God deals with the doctrine of his second coming or his, his dealing with the people of the earth. And then there's the prophetic, and when we get there, we'll see so much of what Zechariah saw happening lining up in the world today. Uh, you know, re revolving around Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. Just think that up until 1948, there was no nation of Israel. From 2000, or, uh, from 2000 years ago, from like 100 A.D., or really about 119 A.D., when the Romans just dispersed the Jews all over the world, until 1948, there was no nation of Israel. But in that 1948, coming out of the, 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 the horror of the Holocaust 
came these Jews. John Pesaric's father was one of them. He fought in the War of Independence in 1948 with, with the Israeli army. Uh, they established their nation. When they established their nation, all the Arab world came against them. They had like two pieces of artillery in all of Israel that they would drag back and forth where they needed them. Uh, and God allowed them. He gave them what they needed to win that war and to establish their nation. Because he knew for prophecy to be fulfilled, there had to be a nation of Israel. There had to be a Jerusalem occupied by the Jews. There will have to be, eventually, a temple built on the Temple Mount. That's going to happen. And again, these things are within imagination. You know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, Bible scholars would scratch their head, and there, was, there were many that believed that there had to be in Israel, but they didn't know how it was going to be accomplished. <laughs> we can look back now and see how God's hand has moved, and will continue to move. Now let's turn to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 1. I'm just going to read a little tonight. It says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been sore displeased with your fathers. Now he starts out by saying, God has been unhappy with the nation of Israel. Now, the whole Old Testament deals with that, all right? Therefore say thou unto them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, says the Lord of hosts. Repeats that Lord of hosts like three times in there. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear nor hearken unto me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and statutes which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did, not, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so has he dealt with us. So the introduction to this prophecy, God is saying, Listen, I've been, I've been pleading with your people for centuries now. It's time you turn. And we know that in the last days, there's a nation of Israel that was established in 1948. They have not turned to the Lord of hosts as a nation. They have not. They are not there in belief. They are there pretty much in unbelief. But there is coming a time when they will again call upon the name of the Lord. In fact, if you go to the back of the prophecy of Zechariah, there's going to come a time when Jesus comes back and sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, the nation of Israel is going to weep because they're going to realize what they did with their Messiah 2,000 years ago, or however long it's going to be when he comes back. They're going to understand that. They're going to say, where do you get the wounds in, in your hands? And he's going to say, I got them in the house of my friends. And they're going to weep and wail and cry because they realized that they missed him the first time they came. That's something that's going to come. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Romans, all Israel shall be saved. That doesn't mean that just because a person's a Jew, it means he's going to go to heaven. But there's coming a time when God will reveal himself again to the nation of Israel. That doesn't, that doesn't remove personal responsibility. I don't want anybody to say that Pastor Carmen teaches that all the Jews go to heaven. There might be a few that teach that. I'm not teaching that. But... There's going to come a time when the nation of Israel will once again turn to their Messiah. They're going to hear his voice and they're going to turn. God, everything that's happening in the world today, all the stuff that's going on, the, 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 the attacks on Israel, everything, it's all working for the purpose of getting them to the place where they'll be ready to receive their Messiah. We know that when he comes back, it'll be in the midst of a great and mighty warfare surrounding Jerusalem. There's going to be great bloodshed, great carnage, and Christ will come back at that time. The Messiah, their Messiah will return in the flesh at that time. And those of us who are in the, in the body of Christ who have been raptured up, we'll be coming back with him. We'll be his armies when he comes back, but we won't have to fire a shot. Because he'll defeat the enemies 
of God with the, with the word of his mouth. But that's coming later in Zechariah. Now in verse 7, we see Zechariah starts to get a series of visions. God is giving him a vision, uh, these visions. And these visions deal with God's dealing with the remnant of Israel in the end times. The way things are going to be. Okay? Look at the first vision. Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the, the month Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. I'm not going to read these names every time. Uh, verse 8. I saw by night, and be, now here was this vision. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were there red horses speckled and white. So he gets this vision with a guy riding a horse, and there's horses behind him. Now where do we read about horses in the Bible? The, where? The, the Revelation, right? The four horsemen, okay, the Revelation. And, and those, the, those four horses, one was red, one was black, one was pale, and one was dappled or speckled, okay? So what we're seeing here is we got this vision that Zachariah gets of this fellow riding a red horse, and there are horses behind him. We know that, that the red represents war, and the black represents uh, uh, famine and death. Uh, or death, and, and uh, the one represents famine, and the other represents, uh, help me, <laughs> my memory slips me. Okay, but they all have a representation of, you know, oh, oh, the one represents the Antichrist, the one riding on the white horse represents the Antichrist with, you know, a, a, a arrows and no bow, and uh, the one represents death, and the one represents famine, and the one represents war. Okay, well here it says that all these horses are appearing, and he says, then I said, oh, my Lord, Zechariah asked, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show you what these be. So it interprets itself. It says right here. The man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord uh, that stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro through the earth and behold, all the earth sits still and is at rest. Now we see here a picture of all these horses really representing, and, and if you look in Revelation, they represent the effects of the Gentile nations in the earth. What the Gentile nations are doing. We know that in the Revelation, we read about the Antichrist, and we read about war, and about famine, and about death. Okay? Here, it says that everything is at rest. Everything is at peace. The, the earth sits still and is at rest. In verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years, the seventy years of their captivity? And the Lord answered the angel and talked with me with good words and comfortable words. He's saying, listen, I'm going to bring peace to Jerusalem. Here's what I believe this, this vision is showing us. Remember when Paul said over in Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians, he said, whenever they say what? Peace and safety? I believe this is a picture of, of the situation in the world when the world powers are getting together and they think that everything is just fine. Everything is just the way it ought to be. We've solved the problems of the world. We've got peace. We've got people you know, getting along with each other. Well, you know how peace treaties are, how long they last. And they're getting along with each other, and everything is just going just fine. I really believe this is a picture of the way things are going to be right before hell breaks loose on this planet, where all the Gentile powers are saying, yeah, everything is fine. Everything's going good. You know, every, we got everything under control. And the angel says, how long will it be before you restore Jerusalem? And the Lord answered and talked with me with uh, good words and comfortable words. Verse 14. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped for, uh, forward the affliction. He's saying, listen, now in those days, again, he's, they just came back from Babylonian captivity. They were under Persian rule at that time, and they would eventually come under Greek rule and then come under Roman rule. Okay, but I believe this is also looking toward the time when, uh, you know, the Antichrist is in control, and Jerusalem is essentially in his hand. 
you know, he, he'll make an, an, uh, a deal with the, with the Jews. We read in Daniel for a seven-year deal with the Jews. And it's really like the time of the Gentiles. That's when, that's when God is going to begin to start things happening where Jerusalem will once again be the seat and, of the king of David, or the throne of David. That's when Christ will come and reign in Jerusalem. That's what God is preparing. Now, Zechariah was thinking in terms of his, his own time frame where he lived. But there's coming a time when Jesus will reign from Jerusalem. That time is coming. And I believe this foreshadows that. He speaks with comfortable words. It says in verse 16, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and the line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall choose Jerusalem. Now we know the history of Jerusalem for the last 2,000 years, 2,500 years. It has not been peaceful. In fact, for many, many centuries, Jerusalem was tread under by the Gentiles. Until 1967, when the, the, the Israeli army marched in and took Jerusalem again. But it's still not in Faith, it's still not in belief. So the time is coming with Zechariah promises. It hasn't happened yet in history. Jerusalem has never been a peaceful place. It's always been a cup of trembling everywhere. But the time is coming when God will once again establish his throne in Jerusalem. Zechariah is seeing way beyond the time we live in right now. Okay, that's the first vision, the first promise that God gives. He will restore Israel to Jerusalem. He will restore Messiah and the kingdom to Jerusalem. Look at verse 18 now. The second vision. Then lifted I up mine eyes and saw and behold four horns. Then I said unto the angel that talk with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have scattered Jerusalem, Israel, uh, Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now when, again, when we read in Daniel when they talked about horns, what did that represent? Represent leaders, kingdoms, kings, power, okay? So, Zechariah has seen his vision, and he's seeing four powers. And again, what are the four powers that dealt with, with Israel? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. After he saw that, they said, The Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, What come these to do? And he sp spoke, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the hand of Judah to scatter it. So what God is saying is, I'm going to send, he says, four carpenters here. What was Jesus when he was here? He was a carpenter. He's saying, I'm going to send these four carpenters in a vision to undo everything the powers of the world have done. All the stuff that's going on in the world today, all the stuff that's going on against Israel will be undone by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what Zechariah is seeing. He's seeing that God is going to, and, and he had no way, you know, I, I don't believe God was showing him the specific things that were going to happen over the next uh, 3,000 years from the point that he's uh, dealing with right here. But he knew that God was going to restore Jerusalem and Israel to its right, rightful place. Okay, so we see four horns and four carpenters. All right, chapter 2. Chapter 2 encompasses like one whole vision. He says, I lifted up my eyes again. Let me get my paper. <clears throat> I lifted up my eyes again and looked and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. You ever see somebody measure, you know, get ready to build something? And... Uh, Guys that build, if you've ever seen with like a tape measure, they're good with a tape measure. Man, they'll pull it out, and they'll, it's like a sword, man. They'll pull it out, and they'll measure stuff, right? He said, I saw a man with a measuring line in his hand, and I said, where are you going? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I said, 
For I, said, says the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire around about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Now just think what God is saying. The restoration of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem has always been embattled. It has always been in the center of battle. But there's coming a time when they won't even need a wall. You know, back when they built cities back in those days, they built walls around them. Uh, the the, 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 the uh, book of Nehemiah is about the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. We talk about building walls and fences, you know, standing in the gap, uh, breaches in the wall, you know, protection. There's going to come a time when Jerusalem isn't going to need a wall because God will be their wall. There's going to come a time when Jerusalem isn't going to need the United States of America to give them weapons. There's going to come a time when Israel isn't going to need the United Nations for nothing. You know, it's the United Nations that established them as a nation. You know that. Back in 1948, they're the ones that voted and said, but they're not going to need, they're not going to need anybody on this earth because God is going to be their defender. God is going to be their protector. In fact, from 1948 to now, I believe that the hand of God has been in the establishment of the nation of Israel. If you read about their battles, if you read about their warfares, they were outnumbered like 10 to 1. Yet they were greatly victorious because of the hand of God. Because God is going to establish, he's going to do what he promised to do. And there has to be a nation of Israel for him to promise that. That's why Satan has tried to wipe them out over the last 2,000 years, even before that. Really, from the very beginning, Satan tried to interrupt the line that would come through the woman. He tried to have the, the, the Jews eliminated over and over and over again. But God, through his miraculous power and mercy, has kept his hand upon them. And he will until his son returns. He's, the Lord says in verse 5, I will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Verse 6, come forth, ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, says the Lord. Deliver yourself, O Zion, that dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory has he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Doesn't mean that everything they do is right as a nation. But when he pulled them out of Egypt, you know, when, when you read back in the book of Exodus, and he pulled them people out of Egypt, and he gave them his law, that's when they became his people. By promise, before that, he promised Abraham that he would have his offspring would be like the sand of the, the seashore and the stars in the sky and so forth. But when they, when they made that covenant of the law on Mount Sinai, they became a nation at that time. They were a nation of Israel. And from that point until this, they have been, even though they've been rebellious, even though they've, they've burnt their children in the fire, they've been disobedient, they've cursed God, they've done everything. He has, he has not forsaken them. God will not turn his back on Israel. He promised, he told the prophet Jeremiah to tell them, as long as the, the waves are crashing against the, the, uh, the seashore, as long as the sun and moon are in the sky, that's how long I'll keep my promise to Israel. So he promised them. He says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to write the law in your heart that you don't have to, you know, teach each other anymore. That time is coming. He says, for behold, I will shake my hand upon them, verse 9. And they shall be a spoil to their servants, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. It's talking about the ones who come against Israel. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, I will dwell in the midst of thee, says the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. If you read through Isaiah, and if you read through the other major prophets, he talks about when Christ comes, all the world is going to go worship him. Jerusalem is going to be the center of the world. It's going to be the place where everybody's going to go to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That time is coming. Now it's a cup of trembling. Now it's a place of great trouble. But God is going to put his glory in the midst of Jerusalem once again. 
It says, And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Uh, the, the prophet here, God's telling him, he's saying, Listen, you tell the world, be ready. Be ready. Because this, this whole place is going to get turned upside down. This world. All the nations, all the powers of the world, all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our God. See, right now, all the kingdoms of our world, I don't think a single one of them gives, gives honor and glory to the God of heaven. Not like they should. But there's coming a time when all the world will worship in Jerusalem. Okay, now chapter 3. There's one more vision we're going to look at tonight, and then we're going we're to close. <laughs> he says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Anybody ever feel like Satan's standing at your right hand? That every time you want to make a move, he's standing right in front of you, trying to block you, you know. You ever do that? Somebody gets in front of you and just dares you to knock a chip off your shoulder, you know. Ain't going to let you pass. Well, Zachariah got this vision. Joshua was the high priest of that time. And he got this vision where here's Joshua. And he's standing before the angel of the Lord. And right beside him, there's Satan. Who's, what's Satan called? He's called the what? Accuser of the brethren. Isn't he? Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee. Hallelujah. <laughs> o Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke, ye, re rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. And stood, now get this picture. Here's Joshua the high priest. And instead of wearing the fine linen garments and the mitre and everything that a high priest would wear, he was dressed in rags, filthy, dirty. And there's Satan standing next to him, and he's pointing and saying, Look, look at this guy. That's your high priest? And the Lord said, I rebuke you. I thank God he rebuked Satan. <laughs> Thank the Lord. We can rebuke him. Don't rebuke him unless it's in the name of Jesus. Okay? You ain't got nothing to rebuke him unless it's in the name of Jesus. All right? We got, but with Christ in us, we have the power to rebuke Satan. All right? Now, he says, he rebuked him. And Joshua was, was clothed with filthy garments. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. He didn't tell Joshua to put them off. He, he told them around, Take them away. Clean them up. I thank God this is about Israel. God's going to clean Israel up. He's going to clean them up and he's going to make them what, they, what he meant them to be at the very beginning. His shining example of who he expects people to be like. He's going to clean them up. And, and this is about Israel, but I thank God he took me and cleaned me up. He took you and cleaned you up. We were standing, we couldn't do it ourselves. He didn't tell Joshua to go take a bath. He told the angels around and said, clean them up. Take away the filthy garments from them. And unto him he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Praise the Lord. God gave me a change of raiment. He gave me a set of clothes I couldn't afford to buy. He gave me a set of clothes that were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. He gave, this, this picture is about Israel, but it's about you and me, too. Because when we were dead in our sins, dead in trespasses, laying in our own blood in the middle of the road, God came and took us and picked us up and cleaned us up and gave us a, a, a clean garments. He said, let them set a fair mitre on his head. So they set a fair mitre on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house. 
and shall also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. He's saying, listen, I'll clean you up. I'll put a miter on your head, but now I'm giving you a commandment. See, he cleaned us up. He picked us up. He saved us by the blood of Jesus. But now he gives us a walk. He wants us to walk. He wants us, listen to what he says. Keep my charge. Uh, 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 back up. Walk in my ways. Keep my charge. Then you shall also judge my house. This salvation thing we talked about here a few weeks ago, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. We don't work for it. It's done for us by the blood of Jesus. But once he cleanses us and makes us new, he says, okay, I expect something from you. Now, here's the, here's the good news. If we, if we don't listen to him, he's not going to let us go. For 2,000 years, the Jews didn't listen to him. Every time, every time he blinked, you know, when they, they'd get in trouble and they'd say, oh, God, help us, help us. So he would help them and they'd say, thank you, God, and for a couple of years, everything would be all right. And then they'd turn and worship another false God. And they kept doing that over and over and over again until he had to send them to captivity for 70 years. Then after that, they came back and, and built this religion, uh, you know, with the Pharisees, where when Jesus came, they nailed him to a cross. He still loves them. He's, he'll do whatever he has. And, and since that time, what has happened to the Jews? They've been thrown out of Jerusalem. They've been put in ghettos. They've been persecuted. They've been uh, inquisi the in inquisition, holocaust, the whole nine yards. Yet they're still a nation of Israel. Why? Because of God's mercy and long suffering. And if he's like that with them, do you think he's going to be like that with you? See, sometimes he lets us go through things because he wants to get our attention. He wants, us, he wants us to be able to stand and say, cleanse me, make me whole. And when he does, he wants us to walk in that. Walk in the Spirit. Verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Who's his servant, the branch? It's Christ. I'll bring forth my Messiah, my servant. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. I'm thinking, where was Nathaniel sitting when Jesus called him? <laughs> There's coming a time when the Messiah is going to return. And in one day, the nation of Israel is going to be restored to their creator, to their king, to their covenant God, to their Messiah in one day. That day's coming, all because of his servant, the branch. I thank God that we can look back to when, and I don't know about you, but Albert and I were talking about this today. I, I don't remember the date, but I remember the place where I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. How many people can remember where you were when you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? It might have been in a church, it might have been in your living room, it might have been in an alley somewhere. But wherever it was, I, I, some folks remember the date. I don't remember the date. But I remember the place, and I remember, I know it happened. That place where he took the filthy garments off me and put the clean garments on me. And that place where, where his servant, the branch, uh, appeared to me and I was cleansed and made whole through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. In one day, in one second, my sins were washed away. And that's the message. You know what? It's, it's not, I, I've been working on this Christian. I've been trying to work out my salvation for about 30 years now. I'm still working on it. But my sins are still washed away. There's nothing I can do to make Jesus say, okay, I'm going to give your sins back to you. The blood of Jesus cleansed me from all sin. His covenant, his, uh, the, the new covenant says this is the, the covenant written in my blood. He's making me, and with every one of us, he's turning us into, conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, because of the servant, the branch. And that's what he's going to do with Israel. That's what he's going to do with the apple of his eye, the nation of Israel. Those are the things that are coming. 
They're in the works right now. You can read about it in the paper every day. You know, Russia and Iran getting together, Putin and Ahmad, whatever his name is. <laughs> and people say, oh, Russia and Iran. Hallelujah. That's great. Because it's just what God says was going to happen. It's, you know, Israel Israel's going to have to strike Iran. Good. Hallelujah. That's what's supposed to happen. Wars brewing in the Mideast. That's right. That's hallelujah. Good. I mean, I don't want to see war, but it's supposed to happen. Things are happening the way the Bible says they're going to happen. Stuff is happening in our nation. Just what the Bible says is going to happen. People turn their back on God. What the Bible says is going to happen. You know, they'll, they'll burn in their lust one for another. That's what it says is going to happen. You shouldn't be surprised. It's happening. Hallelujah. Gives an opportunity to go share the gospel. The further people are away from the gospel, I, I think the hardest people to share the gospel with are people that was raised in church. <laughs> I'd almost rather have somebody who never heard it before. I'd rather, I'd rather see some drunk prostitute, you know, that never heard the gospel and tell them. Because <laughs> the ones that was raised that way, they got their, they got their funny ideas, you know. <laughs> Albert, I, I, me and Albert had a good talk today <laughs> about stuff. All right. Anyhow, praise the Lord. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to come back and establish his kingdom, a millennial kingdom for a thousand years. We're going to live in Jerusalem, and I won't need a passport. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I won't have to go through security. <laughs> well, I might have to fly, yeah, but I don't think it'll be in an airplane. I might be able to do it like <laughs> Okay. Praise the Lord. Anybody have any questions or comments? We'll pick up with this. Next week, barring in the unforeseen.